City Builder games are incredibly interesting when it comes to politics, as the game provides a representation of governance and the policies which directly shape its people's lives in reality. From Marxist literary perspective, as the art is the product of the developer's economic circumstance and their ideology, a game like this will always be political. Phil Hartup, in a short article about politics in the game City Skylands, wrote, When a game in this genre sets out its win conditions, or at least its terms for progress, it is in effect stating what the developers believe a successful city should look like. If you try to build a city in a manner that does not agree with the intentions of the game developers, then your city will probably fail. If you follow their rules, success is yours. City Skylines is currently the dominant city builder. Developed by Colossal Order, based in Finland, it provides a lightweight experience unburdened by the history of how cities grow. So, what does City Skylines say about how cities are built and how to make a successful one? To do this, we must make our own city. Welcome to Springwood, a generic American city. The game starts us with a greenfield site connected to a motorway and you cover it in a metropolis by building roads, zoning residential, commercial and industrial land according to demand. Running a comically oversized and simplified electricity system by connecting a high voltage line to a residential area, which apparently just works. There is a sewage system which dumps shit in, an, in the nearby river, which we also drink from, but who cares as long as it's downstream. Uh, we also have to provide state-funded health, fire and police services. The wind conditions of city skylines are keeping your citizens happy, make a profit and to keep growing, covering nature with concrete. I think it's only fair to compare city skylines to another recent city builder, Workers and Resources, Soviet Republic, developed and published by 3 Division, based in Slovakia. Set during the Cold War, the game provides you with your very own Soviet Republic and a planned economy to run. With such a different setting, these games should be also be very different, apart from the basic mechanics of a city builder, of course. However, this is far from the case. The game starts with a nondescript location in Eastern Europe between NATO and the Warsaw Pact. Let us call it the Democratic People's Soviet Socialist Republic of Sokovia. We have the option of there being pre-existing villages and towns from before the revolution. One of the first things that will strike you is how clunky and difficult the game is. You have to purposefully level land to begin construction using rubles or dollars. Our first concern is creating power, which can be exported to the Soviets. To do this, we need to build a coal mine and a processing plant to convert coal ore into something we can burn. This will then be conveyed down the hill to an aggregate storage, then to our coal power plant, to begin polluting the atmosphere. We will also need workers, so I will need to build a model Soviet town for them to live in. I begin by building apartment blocks nearby. This creates a population who have needs. To fulfil them I will need shops, pubs, football fields, a kindergarten, a school and some space left to build three statues of Lenin when I have more money. We also need a bus service to transport our workers up to the mine and power plant. I also create a basic energy grid to power everything while the coal power plant is being constructed. There is a much higher level of detail in workers and resources Soviet Republic, from the need to construct footpaths to buying individual vehicles. This has taken me much more times to get right showing the impossible tasks central planners faced in trying to organise a working economy, even though I only have to manage a small town rather than the Soviet Union. Eventually, income begins to come in, and I set about expanding my town further. Just as in city skylines, the goal is exponential growth, through profit and fulfilling workers' needs to keep them happy and productive. The only difference is that in workers and resources Soviet Republic, I have the option of achieving resource independence and constructing everything from my own building materials. With this in mind, I'm going to take the time to dunk on a Guardian Cities article from five years ago for no reason. The article is supported by the Rockefeller Foundation, the one that um, supported Nazi eugenic programs by the way. Finn Williams, the writer, tries to create a post-growth anti-capitalist city 
but creates no commercial zones, i.e. no shops. In city skylines, industry zones create products, which are then sold through commercial zones to people living in residential zones. It is no wonder that William City collapsed, as there was no, no distribution network for the items being produced. To be fair on Williams, the game provides no alternatives to shops, but then neither does workers and resources Soviet Republic. The only difference is that one is controlled by the state, while the other seems to be private. I said seems, because what is the difference between the mechanics of land zoning and state planning? Because in city skylines, this is the main difference between private and public buildings. You zone a residential area, but you place a hospital. The Industries DLC also adds specialised industry, which you have to individually place, which, again, seems to be state-owned as you reap the profits and the costs. However, it does not specify exactly. Another YouTuber, Do Not Eat Zero One, provides an excellent review, nicknaming it the State Capitalism DLC. In City Skylines, the game puts the state as the legitimate owner of all otherwise unowned land. Zoning just allows buildings to be constructed on the land. The owners of these properties seem to have no property rights, as you can arbitrarily demolish the buildings at any time to build a statue of shopping. Just like Brazil's favelas, most of which have informal property rights and get demolished so Rio can look good at the Olympics. We can do the same thing in Workers and Resources Soviet Republic, but then again, demolishing a small European village is an expected part of running a ruthless dictatorship, not your local city government. In the real world, it'd be crazy if 2,000 buildings were to be demolished under compulsory purchase for a high-speed railway that will never be built. It would never happen. Tucker, an American libertarian socialist and later egoist, identified land as one of the state's four legal monopolies that allowed them to oppress workers. Instead, he argued that property rights should only be defended if they are based on actual occupancy and use. This is called usufruct property ownership. You can own the land you work or live on. This eliminates absentee ownership completely. This is a radical alternative to our current system of property ownership. You may say, that City Skylines just gamifies real-world property laws to allow fun, but real-world zoning laws also do this. Many libertarian types see zoning laws as a violation of property rights, as the state has no legitimate control over previously unowned land. Unowned land is just that, unowned land. This means that zoning laws are a coercion, as it's done by a city planner rather than the honest preferences of local citizens who actually live there. City Skylines has no mechanic that just lets people build their homes themselves. Instead, the supposedly free market between buildings in the game is organised by top-down planning, with all the same flaws as that of the USSR. So, what information does the planner, appointed by Ghostplan, in running their centrally planned city, have? You have three bars that apparently show perfect demand for each type of zone, which can be satisfied by zoning any part of the map regardless of its location, leading to citizens driving across the entire city to buy a pint of milk because the central planner has made a large block of residential without any shops. City skylines, simplicity and willingness to brush aside problems makes the task of the central planner seem easy and intuitive. Workers and Resources, Soviet Republic, for a game that seems to glorify central planning in a jokey way, through its complexity, shows how hard meeting the needs of your citizens is, through complex supply chains that always break down somewhere, and the fact that I still do not know how trains work. My seventh Soviet Republic kind of works, but the sixth before it provide a damning critique of the centrally planned system. Given the similarities between the two games, that are meant to portray two different systems, maybe those systems are more similar than you might think. If it goes well, I will continue in a part two of this, which will focus on production and the similarities between large corporations and the Soviet planning system.